Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I am Laura Carfing, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. Good morning, everyone. Oh my gosh, I love tuning in each week and connecting with all of you. It literally allows me to jump out of bed, head over to the microphone, and say hello to all of you. So good morning. I'm so happy we're able to connect today on Breast Cancer Conversations. I'm your host, Laura Karfik, and if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast and receive notifications each week when we come out with a new episode. You can find our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. We also started something new. If you haven't heard of Patreon, go check it out. We have our very own Patreon account, and it is a great way to support the work that we do so we can continue to offer this content. To all of you who tune in each week, welcome back. We have so much to catch up on. Thanks for being here. I am so excited today because we are going to be speaking with Michelle Sadaka. He is the founder of Storm My Tumor, which is one of our corporate sponsors, and I am so thrilled to have this in-depth conversation with him. We talk about so many great topics. I know as someone who's going through a cancer diagnosis, if you're someone like me, you're Googling absolutely everything, and it can be quite overwhelming. We talk about topics like precision medicine, targeted therapies, personalized medicine, immunotherapies, genomic sequencing, sensitivity sequencing, and testing. These are all terms that I feel like sometimes we use interchangeably, and it's very hard to understand the actual difference in all of the treatment options we have available to us. In this conversation, we talk about the standard of care and how Storm My Tumor is able to be an added complement and reassurance plan to a breast cancer diagnosis. So I'm so pleased to dive right in. Welcome to the conversation. All right, let's jump right in. Yeah. So, I mean, I have so many questions. So I think one of the things that I would love our audience to know, because we've been talking about um, Storm My Tumor on the podcast and letting people know that it's a great opportunity for people to store their live tissue or tumor cells um, at the time before they go through any active treatment. Because it's my understanding that what you guys excel in is having like kind of like the tumor in its most natural state before it goes through like the radiation and the um, chemotherapies or neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And I would love to know how people, like are you communicating with doctors about this option? Because I'm going back to my experience. I would have loved to know right. about this, right? And I think that's what I tell a lot of people, like how come we don't know about this? No one, like when I get my biopsy done or when I have my surgery, I actually never asked, where does my tumor go? Like, do you just scoop it out and throw it away? Or like, what happens? And so I would love your expertise and background on a little bit about this process and the intervention, so to speak, of where consumers and people who've been diagnosed with cancer should start reaching out to you guys and what that process looks like and how they can have that conversation with their medical team as well. So th th there's multiple ways I can answer this uh, this uh, uh, question. Uh, on one hand, um, maybe we can start by setting a baseline with a standard of care. <clears throat> so today, almost every hospital, with no exceptions to my knowledge, um, they all take a small part of the tumor and preserve it in paraffin. And then they embed that in formalin. And that's done by a big department in the hospital called pathology. We all are familiar with pathology report. And that usually is, it's all about uh, confirming that this is cancer. If so, what stage it is, what kind of, uh, you know, it's uh, where it comes from, sort of the pathology report, uh, very basic parameters. Uh, what hospitals do not do is take the rest of the tumor and preserve it in a live state. So keep the cells alive. Mm. It's not really standard of care yet. I'm sure one day it will become. Uh, but we're just not there yet. The point of doing that actually is uh, to personalize the treatment. So we also all know that the treatments today are not working or you know, they work for a small part of the population depending on your disease, uh, uh, disease level. If you're stage one, stage two with breast cancer, which is relatively uh, easy disease, uh, we work with all other diseases, so we talk in relative terms. Um, the standard care, with the standard care, you're going to be okay. But as the 
as you're diagnosed with a more aggressive or late stage, you need more tools. It's almost like having a fire in your kitchen. Small fire, little towel, little water, bigger fire. As it burns, you need the extinguisher. The bigger it gets, you need a fire department and so forth. And then, you know, you, you need to just delay the, 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 the burning so that the, fire, the, the house stays there for a little longer. It's a little bit of the same analogy. And so, so that we preserve the cancer cells at any point in time. It doesn't have to be before the first surgery. You can do it at any point in time, second surgery, surgery, surgery uh, a biopsy, any time, um, uh, even if you have metastasis, any time you have cancer cells, we take a part of those and we preserve them in a way that keeps them alive. And the reason you want these cells to be alive is because you can study different medication. Mm. You can test different combinations on them. You see what works, what doesn't. Uh, you can also study them from a genomic perspective and study what's so unique about them. Because the way we treat cancer is, you know, we have standard sort of procedures for cancer A. If you're stage one, here's your choices. If you're stage two, three, what have you. And we have these decision trees, mm -hmm. which is great to start with. But as we begin to know more about the tumor, we know what's so specific about it. We can begin to say, well, this tumor is not just a breast tumor, breast cancer tumor. It has, you know, mutation X. And therefore, there's a smarter drug that can work on that specific tumor. So the more we know about it, the more we can study it, uh, the more we can prescribe smarter medicine um, and, and more personalized approaches that have a higher chances of working. So that's on the drug level. We, we, we can use the cancer cells to prioritize uh, the, the choice of drugs. Mm -hmm. That is, that's so logical. It defies the, the, the rationale and the reasoning behind the, the, the current state of affairs with regards to oncology. It just, it just makes perfect sense to me. So that's, I guess, what we have to do with regards to uh, spreading that word and educating people. And, and... It's, it's a logical progression of, of how you know, we're moving into treating cancers. I mean, if you look at it from, a, you know, 30,000 feet, so to speak, uh, you know, first you're diagnosed, you have something abnormal. First reaction, take it out, which is mm -hmm. surgery, right? Right. Second approach was, let's do chemo. Let's, you know, bombard the area and kill every remaining cell in the area, which kills the good cells and bad cells, right. equivalent to throwing a bomb, right? Correct. Which which still is the major side of, of, of uh uh, of the standard care. It is the, the biggest uh, value one can get in treating cancer. Right. The third one is, well, now we have smarter drugs, targeted drugs. Let's use those, right? So we're moving in that direction. And then there's, you know, uh, radiation therapy and more targeted precision uh, approaches. What we're also uh, moving towards is immunotherapy. <clears throat> in addition to throwing bombs and trying to get rid of um, you know, cancer cells and, 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 and good cells and bad cells, we're moving towards understanding how the immune system, how we can teach the immune system to recognize cancer and begin to attack it as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a parallel, you know, think of them as different pillars, so to speak. Right. Um, you're, the cancer cells play a major role in two of these major pillars. Mm -hmm. um, in choosing smarter and, and uh, uh, in making a more informed decision about the drugs that may work and prioritizing the right uh, combination and in immunotherapy to design treatments from your cells um, to awaken your immune system and, and point them in the right direction. So can you tell me a little bit more about these immunotherapies? That might be a new term for some of our listeners as well because mm -hmm. we're so used to just hearing chemotherapy, chemotherapy. And so I would love for you to maybe dive a little bit deeper in what this process is like for taking our own tumor cells and teaching our immune system again to recognize these characteristics. Sure. Uh, maybe I should just uh, introduce that a little bit uh, broadly as well. Yes, please. So immune therapy in general is, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, the tumor basically, the cancer cells are smart enough to camouflage themselves and hide. So you have this natural way of the 
the, the immune system is the natural, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the natural uh, army of the body, which doesn't see the problem. So it's, you know, it's sleeping and the problem mm. is beginning to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's different approaches to immunotherapy and, and uh, some of it is experimental. There's two, there's immunotherapies from drugs and, and the audience may have heard about checkpoint blockades, for example, which I will, I will get back to. But there's a different category with cellular immunotherapy. So treatments that are designed from the cells, from your own cells. <clears throat> um, uh, all this can put into simpler language um, the audience may have heard about vaccines, for example, which is a very popular term. Tills, another approach. Uh, so there's different approaches to mobilizing the immune system. And, and what, maybe we can put them in plain language. Imagine there's a battle, right? There's a, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's an army fighting some battle. Uh, checkpoint blockades is the equivalent of, uh, uh, you know, engineering your uh uh, engineering your uh, uh, your best soldiers uh, and, and making them, um, um, like, like giving them more artillery, arming them with better tools to fight stronger, right? That's one approach. Another approach on the vaccine front is um, you recruit more soldiers to the battle. So you have a million soldiers, all of a sudden you can have, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions, and you can do a better fight. A third approach with, with T-cell therapy or TILS is to choose your best soldiers and then you clone them and multiply them into also billions and then, you know, fight. So they're all sort of logical approaches uh, from a 30,000 foot perspective. Uh, some of those are experimental. They're in different clinical trials in the U.S. or internationally. Many of our patients uh, go to Germany or Japan because uh, they have more flexible uh, regulatory environments and these uh, applications could be uh, given uh, in, in private clinics or hospitals. Uh, the process is fairly straightforward. Uh, once they, they require the cells, um, that's what we specialize in. We preserve the cells in different formats. So these applications are possible in the future. Mm -hmm. And we, 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 we cryopreserve them, we split them into different valves and we can coordinate a whole bunch of things in parallel. So we don't like to think of immunotherapy versus something else. Um, we can take a part of the specimen and coordinate a genomic um, test. We can take another part and coordinate a, uh, a sensitivity test. And we can take a third part uh, and release it to a center that does immunotherapy as well. So the, the combination of those each one drives value to the patient in a different context. Uh, and uh, and uh, if we have enough and we do multiple things, good for the patient. Um, we, we, we always uh, get into these discussions of what should we do, mm -hmm. because some of it is difficult and uh, it has to be considered in the context of the overall treatment. <laughs> um, um, uh, the different, this is personalized medicine. So we have to consider different tools and, and we have these different uh, uh, applications or our tools that we can juggle, but we have to right size it to the right, to the patient at the right stage. Mm. So for early, early stage patient, we say, you know, you probably don't need any of this. Second stage, third stage, we start saying, look, you can be a little bit more relaxed. The fire is still burning, but could be controlled by the fire department, which is this, the standard of care. When the fire sort of gets a little bit beyond that, we start thinking about um, um, uh, genomic sequencing, for example, to identify the right drugs and work more smartly. Mm. Uh, if the cancer reoccurs, for example, we immediately think about, well, we need to think deeper about the problem. Uh, we think about sensitivity analysis. If the treatment is not working, we also think about resistance. Does this patient, uh, are they not responding to the chemo or the combination because they're resistant to that? Uh, so th there are steps that you can begin to prioritize there. Mm -hmm. And in terms of immunotherapy, for patients that uh, are in remission or right after surgery, um, and they want a strategy to stay in remission longer, 
uh, that's usually a, a good approach also. Um, we like to give the example of Pac-Man. Uh, we're really big on examples because patients yeah. tell us there's something they could really relate yeah, to absolutely. as opposed to talking in technical terms, which we could also do. <laughs> uh, but the idea of immunotherapy uh, when it comes to a vaccine, for example, is we would like to give the idea of Pac-Man because mm -hmm. you see these things going all over the bloodstream and eating cancer cells. Right. And when that happens, less cancer cells means longer time in remission. Mm -hmm. and it's good for the patient. So um, we try to use these funny analogies just to make it a little bit more um, stick and, and, and mm -hmm. make it uh, easier to understand. But the whole point, we have a problem, we have a big problem, we use the tumor to, to better understand that problem. Uh, we study it, we profile it, we study different approaches on it, we experiment on the tumor before giving treatments to the patients. Um, um, and, and we also can design immunotherapies on this side. Uh, some patients also have, uh, it's my last comment, uh, some patients also have, um, you know, they have diseases for, of unknown uh, origin, for example, mm -hmm. right. um, which even begs the uh, question of doing more research on them. So as the problem advances, we begin to study it more and we do more research and help in, in um, the, the, the right decisions. That's brilliant. The um, I guess my my next point would be to, to to state how in your webinar you went through the entire process so that you you're explaining that process to uh, potential patients uh, to listen and hear what what they would be going through, what their basically the all of the steps leading up to that um, that cancerous tissue being deposited in the lab and for discovery and, and, and due diligence. So if you would run through that, I, I thought that that was brilliant as well on your webinar. Uh, sure. So uh, the process has been designed to be as simple as possible because we understand the patient has surgery and they are in a very bad stage. Um, at this time, at that time, it starts with calling us. We send them some forms. They fill the forms, send them back to us, consent. Uh, then we coordinate shipping a collections kit. It's a styrofoam box, the size of a shoebox. Uh, we send it to uh, the patient or at some centers. It's already in pathology at the large centers. Um, it has instructions how to for the surgeon or the clinical team to pack the tumor back into the the box and it travels back uh, to us via FedEx. And uh, uh, when we get it, uh, we process it immediately and report back to the patient what we received and what they have preserved. Um, then we schedule a call a couple of weeks, typically after surgery, giving the patient some time to, to recover. Uh, educational call, we go over the options. Uh, this is really outside the scope of service, but we do it just we want to educate as much as possible. So we, we help patients understand the different applications uh, from a lay term. Uh, and we also send them some reading material, heavier stuff. We encourage them to talk to their oncologist. And then we all stand by waiting for instructions of um, what would you like us to do. Uh, it's a cooperation between the patient and the oncologist. Um, uh, we're not clinical advisors, but we, uh, we coordinate all this in the background. Uh, and um, that's it. Uh, from there, you know, they, they, uh, we begin to, to work for them. And 50% of the patients uh, order something from us within the first six months, okay. whether it's a diagnostic or whether they have an immunotherapy trial in mind or, you know, they, they, uh, some of them already come with a specific mm -hmm. goal of, I want to use my tumor for this trial. And then they find us backwards or so forth. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that's really important too. I we have a lot of women who are advanced stage cancer, and it's very challenging to find these clinical trials because the the requirements to even get into one of these clinical trials are so specific. And so, just being able to find resources and support for people who are looking for that piece of hope and new treatment and experimentation, this is a really great option. Yeah. Um, yes, indeed. Finding a clinical trial is a very challenging uh, 
and taunting job, mm -hmm. primarily because you know it's written in scientific language. You go to NIH.gov, and I mean, mm -hmm. for the average person, it's 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 written for MD PhD level. Right. Uh, so it, it's very difficult. Um, uh, so we we don't really help in that specific aspect, and I don't think anybody can, including the oncologists. Sometimes they just it's very daunting. Yeah. Um, that's why cancer centers refer patients internally to their trials. It's just, right. it is how it is. Uh, many of our patients from an immunotherapy perspective, after going through the due diligence of trying to screen for a trial and finding a trial and so forth, um, oftentimes they decide to go internationally for treatment when they have the right resources, primarily because Structurally, if you think about a trial, you design an experiment, an academic or scientist designs an experiment. He says, I want to test this specific element and I want 20 subjects or 50 or, or 10 or what have you. Uh, so you're really a subject in the experiment and, and uh, as the experiment advances, it becomes more standard for everybody. Um, if you look at, if this is a, a standard uh, uh, if this is an accepted treatment, um, and I'm speaking to international centers in Germany and Japan and so forth, um, the patient arrives there, <clears throat> they look at the patient, and they say, okay, so you need, we have this tool, this tool, this tool. Uh, and they design these around the patient. So it's a different approach entirely as opposed to limiting the patient to one specific protocol. Um, it's more tailored and designed around the patient. Mm -hmm. So different patients, different approaches. Yeah. That's the beauty of personalized medicine is <clears throat> uh, we're at a stage where we truly are getting better at treating cancer. And there are some tools available, but it's it needs pre-planning. Uh, it's almost like uh, someone who's been living in a desert for a very long time and been used to that terrain. All of a sudden, you move them down to the coast and you tell them about you know storms and, and you know right. flood insurance and so forth, and they just don't understand. It's a little bit stormite tumor is a little bit of that. You're getting into a new terrain, mm -hmm. and we're offering you this kind of insurance policy. It's a short term. We know that you will need it. Fifty percent use it for the first six months. Uh, it's a great lifeline, um, but it's it's a new terrain, and that's that's why it's challenging to explain that to uh, to somebody who's new to the world of cancer. <clears throat> exactly, and from the patient perspective, this is new to us from day one. You know, we talk a lot um, in the community where your oncologist or the nurse or the nurse navigator is telling you and trying to share with you. Um, you know, the, when you hear those terrible words, you have cancer, we've scheduled all these appointments for you, and it's a whirlwind. When you get a copy of your pathology report, these are terms that the medical field uses every single day, day in and day out. And I remind people that, you know, this is the first time I'm hearing this, so, you know, it can't just roll off your tongue that easily, right? Because it's new terminology to me. Um, so it sounds like, too, with stormite tumor being this new terrain, Again, it's just one more, um, you know, option for us to learn about. But then, hopefully, as you were alluding to earlier in the conversation, that this eventually becomes the standard of care, where we are able to preserve a lot more of our live tumor cells. I'm trying yes. to think. One of the things that, again, just to put it in context and using my own experience, um, you know, one of the things that. I'm horrified of is the recurrence, right? Like right now, there's no evidence of disease. And some days, I don't even think about cancer. And then other days, I'm about two and a half years out from my initial diagnosis. So I haven't quite yet hit like the five year mark. Um, but it's scary, right? Like it's, I'm almost sometimes in disbelief that I'm in quotes, like healthy, and that I'm okay, because I've been so used to 18 months of treatments and therapies and this idea of being sick and fighting the cancer that it's very hard to believe that like okay you're okay now go back to work your hair is coming back like everything's fine just go on your way um in the event that there is a recurrence would i still be eligible to use your resources absolutely okay so uh yes i, I mean we, we work with patients in, in all kinds of different patients some are living in fear on a daily basis because it's a second, third, fourth recurrence and it's just problem keeps getting worse. So 
you're relatively you're, you're in a good place and i, I wish you the very <laughs> oh, best thank you yeah <laughs> you're not going um, wood absolutely so, <laughs> and, and that's we start profiling patients in different categories so that we can help them understand this in the context of things so uh, let, let's let's be negative for a second and and imagine if, if you were to reoccur for example mm-hmm. um first thing that they will see some mass they will say you need to take it out um, uh, um yes we can preserve that mass and it's the same process from there we could uh, depending on what what stage that disease is if it's an early stage then you know we're not going to do much we're probably going to advise not to start if it's a later stage then we can begin to profile it and, and study it and so forth um, uh, sometimes uh, one of the misconceptions is that uh, you know i can always do this later mm. which is true in a way it, it, like someone in your position that that applies to it perfectly because you've been in remission for five years um, you know, what are the chances? You're, it's a low percentage. Uh, it's not the case with every patient. If you're a stage three, stage, stage three, for example, you do your surgery, it recurs, you might not be eligible for a second surgery. They might right. not operate on you. So you're losing an opportunity. Uh, there's many different scenarios like this. Um, um, it really, we take it a case by case and we say, broadly speaking, if the cancer, if you have a rare cancer, uh, if you have a cancer of uh, unknown origin, if you have reoccurred, um, mm-hmm. if you have an advanced stage, aggressive disease, if your treatment is not working, um, if you have doubt that your the, the chemo, your, your resistance to chemo, uh, if you're having a lot of side effects from the treatment, if you want to consider immunotherapy, these are the sort of questions right. we begin to ask. And if you fall into these categories, it absolutely makes sense to preserve uh, the, the tumor or mm-hmm. a biopsy right. at any point in time. <laughs> yeah, I've heard some interesting stories too that just kind of blow. Excuse me, that just kind of blow my mind. I um, was talking to some women where there was a recurrence, unfortunately, but the type of cancer that came back was. A completely different makeup than her original diagnosis. So, like in the breast cancer field, um, which is what I'm, I'm more aware of, is you know you can be like an ER positive, estrogen receptor positive, um, hormonal based, estrogen based uh, tumor cell, but then if it recurs, it can come back not responsive to the chemotherapies and be like a triple negative type yep. of. Um, cancer. So I thought so that was just that's so interesting. That's actually a very good point, yeah. and it's a common misconception, uh, and, and often we hear it from oncologists as well. It is a misconception uh, along the lines of why would you store your tumor? It's going to change. Tumors evade the treatment or they adapt to the new environment of, of uh, with the drugs, and they mutate continuously and change, and that's why cancer is such a big problem to treat Mm -hmm. it's just a moving target so to speak when you aim it it moves and it's a constant uh, uh, you know game Uh, it it is true cancer absolutely mutates but it adds mutations as opposed to change entire personalities it adds mutations which has which depending on the application if we work it backwards you see if it's relevant to preserve, uh, to work from an old preserved tumor versus a new biopsy. And we have a long answer in our on our website under FAQs. It's probably a number one question or, or number two uh, to just share with you a little bit of, of uh, perspective on that. So for genomic profiling, it absolutely makes sense to work from a new biopsy instead of an old tumor. For a sensitivity analysis, it's not always that simple. It's we need volume and um, we can work from old. It, it's not often the case. You, you can't really have that many. Uh, you need to have a surgery. It's a, it's a race with time. Mm-hmm. So you can't wait for the surgery. And then uh, sometimes there is an advantage to use the old tumor and, and do a spot check quickly. Sure. For immunotherapy, an old tumor is just as good as a new tumor because we're, we're trying to um, use that tumor to target specific, unique uh, uh, mutations or antigens on the tumor. And uh, if it's adding, uh, great, but we still have a lot of unique ones in the old one. And we also need volume. So it's, it's just as good as an old one. 
So technical answer, we have a we have it all written. It's probably easier <laughs> yes. to read, uh, but it's uh, you know again personalized medicine. We're, we're trying to work with the best that we have, and uh, ninety percent of the time, the old tumor is sometimes the only uh, um, uh, opens new doors that that otherwise would not have been open. Um, so it, it is 90% of the time a leverage, mm. but yeah, there are some cases where it's, it cannot be of benefit, sure. and that's probably a 10%. Well, this, and, and I guess the significance of this for us in, in communicating that to the communities, typically the oncological team is the primary caregiver. When, they, when the patient ceases with the active treatment, post-traumatic stress disorder of one variety or another starts to set in and that's when they start to have doubts and I've, I've spoken to 30,000 uh, breast cancer survivors they every single one of them every single one not one has varied from that they all say the same thing and this can be kind of uh, an insurance policy and a reassurance policy that um, things can be under your control and that um, intellectually and scientifically you can be working this, this uh, uh, schematic to make it work for you to alleviate a lot of that stress. So uh, that's, yeah. that, intrigued, that intrigued me just having this discussion again. And I know it's the second time I've heard it and the bells start to ring and, and um, I think it offers uh, a solution to that uh, PTSD, especially for the advanced um, diagnoses. Yeah, it's kind of like connecting the dots with all these conversations that we're having where um, recently on the podcast, we were speaking with a psychologist who was talking to us exactly about this, like, you know, something that's like cancer that is so complex and out of our control as the patient what is in our control and so having an opportunity where we feel like we're doing the best we can with the resources that we have knowing that we're being as aggressive as we're able to be um is a really great option to give people just one more leverage of a way to take ownership of their health care right yeah we, we've had some patients or, or members of the patients comedy call us and say I, I don't really care what you guys do I just want to do it so I don't feel guilty that I did not exhaust all my options. Yes. Right. Um, I mean, there, there, there is a psychology there, absolutely. And I, I've, had, I've lost members of my family as well and, uh, and to cancer. And, and uh, I, I certainly can understand that. It, it, the cancer rocks the entire, your entire world and family and your support and consumes everybody around it. It's not just the patient's decision. Um, we, we, while we're while we understand that these dynamics happen and, and in a way glad that you know what, what however you enter into this mm -hmm. fine uh, we try to focus on the clinical benefits and right. we, we uh, um, certainly when you look at genomic sequencing and and i mean it's a huge industry with big companies and like cares foundation one onco dna tempest and the list goes on and on it's almost becoming a standard of care when you look at, and, and, and these are big forces, everybody talks about uh, uh, targeted treatments, about uh, precision medicine, and that's really what they're referring to. Mm -hmm. We take this a step further and we say, look, there's other also smart tests you can do if you have the tumor available in, 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 a, in a live state, if you have the cells alive. Instead of trying to statistically study what works best on it, and, and by the way, there was an interesting study from Moe Sloan Kettering saying genomic sequencing gives, uh, yields a clinical benefit to only 30% of the population, but yet everybody orders it as it's almost a standard. And uh, that's because sometimes you don't really have actionable mutations or sometimes you don't find anything specific. So, um, so we, we like to complement diagnostics and, and do a couple instead of one. Um, it's like having different pieces of the puzzle and you know you, you look at one piece and the more pieces you put together the clearer the picture is it's a little mm -hmm. bit of a similar analogy diagnostics are not accurate by nature it's like getting a blood test or getting a pathology report you always get a validation sometimes <laughs> with a tumor it, it's really the case uh, we sent uh, to give you another example we send a formula block so a specimen of a patient to different labs and and 
almost every time we get different results. Huh. Mm -hmm. And that's primarily because, you know, the, the tumor is heterogeneous. So it's not the same. The cancer cells on a slide are not the same. So if you look on the right side or left side, you're going to get slightly different results. Mm. Um, and and, and, uh, uh, and the, sensi the lab sensitivity to, you know, what is a mutation. There's a lot of science behind it. Um, at the end of the day, we try to the message from our end is try to do multiple diagnostics and cross-reference the results. And mm. Only when you get the same mutation in, in, or the same recommendation from two different results, well, you know, that's really a strong recommendation. Yes, well, that's a really good point. I would love to pick your brain a little bit more because I'm always confused about some of these terminologies, such as you're mentioning targeted therapies, personalized medicines, immunotherapies, genetic sequencing. They are different, right? They're not used interchangeably. Absolutely. Do you mind giving now, well, us a better some definition? Some are. Some are. A lot of, okay. I mean, there, there's a lot of, uh, I think that, you know, the, the oncology, the cancer world has been sleeping for the past maybe 50 years in a way. We haven't made any large advancements. Over the past 10, 15 years with the whole genetic, you know, ability to study a tumor and profile it ge genetically, that, that started moving a huge revolution. It revolutionized the entire industry. So by, by understanding what's so unique and pinpointing the speci specific characteristic of that tumor, which is like a fingerprint, um, you know, we, we can better prescribe medicine. And that's what they started referring to as precision medicine, as in, you know, what we're, uh, uh, it is a more precise way of treating uh, or targeted uh, therapy, uh, which is we can better target the, the mutation as opposed to working from a category, uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, and then sort of immunotherapy is a whole different discipline and movement, which also picked up momentum about maybe also about 10, 15, so around the same time uh, with CAR T cells and, and vaccines and now new antigen vaccines and TILs. And th there's many different approaches. And the easiest way to understand it is think of a battle and sort of different strategies that one mm -hmm. can do to, to make their uh, uh, army stronger. Um, uh, so, uh, and all this started being referred to as uh, personalized medicine, as in we want to design treatments that are more personalized, um, or sometimes you hear sniper analogy as opposed to, you know, you throw a bomb at something or you, you mm -hmm. use a sniper to just take off the... Yeah. Um, so it's all about designing smarter treatment. Uh, we're beginning to understand um, cancer on a deeper level and therefore the treatments are getting smarter. Are we, are we making progress? Absolutely. Is the progress fast enough? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, you know, we still, for certain cancers, we like um, uh, ovarian cancer, for example, I mean, it, we know that 85% of the population will reoccur. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, there's still huge problems and, and even the smallest dent you can do to extend someone's life give them more time is, is a huge benefit. So different diseases, different uh, statistics. Um, uh, at the end of the day, each one of us is an individual. And if we can design treatments around the individual and more personalized, we can improve their quality of life and their, their treatment outcomes. Yes, I love that. And another key takeaway when I was listening to your webinar was also you know, around the quality of life and also the toxicity that we are putting into our bodies, right? So if we're giving ourselves this standard of care of chemotherapy that is killing all of our cells that are making the good cells and the bad cells die, um, you know, if we have an option of this personalized medicine that's much more targeted, um, you know, overall, I think the, the toxicity that's going into our body is much more direct and impactful right as, a, as opposed to in, scattering in shots yes mm -hmm. in principle of course if we move to precision medicine or personalized medicine it's a 
you know, it's, it's a huge advantage to patients, mm -hmm. but we're not there yet. And, and chemotherapy is still the standard of care today. And we never really recommend sort of, we have some patients sometimes they come to us very frustrated and you know, they've had it, they went to first oncologist, second oncologist, that's a fourth, fifth, and, and they're just frustrated because there's no more options for them. Right. They're getting the same response. Like I don't have options or, or they have such a bad um, side effects from chemo and their quality of life is, is horrible and they're really contemplating stopping chemo and, and accepting a shorter period of time left uh, but a better quality and, and our response has always been we are not going to give you clinical advice and we are definitely not against chemo chemo is the standard you do the chemo if we can help you with optimizing decisions around that or, or a supplemental treatment in addition that could work in parallel like immunotherapy for example or if we can optimize a choice of chemo or, or confirm mm -hmm. uh with with externally confirm um that is a huge benefit so um you know we're definitely not against chemo um, no. um uh, that is the oncologist decisions with the patient but we mm -hmm. can optimize the choices yeah. Oftentimes, we can also recommend combinations. Um, so, you know, chemo 1 plus chemo 2 would work better than either alone or so forth. Exactly. There are panels that can study that. Yeah, and, and I'm still excited. Yeah. I, I have a huge binder of all of my pathology reports, and every time I go to the doctors, I have them print out all this paper for me. Um, but I have to keep going back and reminding myself what type of cancer I had and all of its characteristics. And one thing that reminded me, too, because I thought when I first got diagnosed, okay, you go to your doctors. Prior to cancer, I just had colds or the flu. You go to the doctors, they give you a medicine, you get better. This was the first time that I realized that cancer is not a perfect science and that there's a lot of tweaking that goes on from, you know, your weekly appointments. I remember even my oncologist, you know, when they do your lab reports and doing your blood, um, you know, just trying to figure out what that right dose of chemotherapy is then reading all the new studies that are coming out saying, okay, well, maybe we want to now add, you know, a complement chemotherapy to it. And as like the A-type person who was like, no, I had a plan. I have like 12 weeks of this. What do you mean we're changing it up? And it took me a really long time to kind of let go and understand that, you know, this is a process, a journey, and it's going to evolve because we want to make sure that as the cancer is evolving and adapting and understanding the new environment, that we're one step ahead of it. So that was eye-opening and something I want to share with our listeners too that Absolutely. this was news to me. Yes, and, and that's, uh, we, we hear that often and that's sort of an initial indication how experienced the patient is or mm -hmm. whether still, you know, they're at the early stage Sorry. in that battle. Um, it's, uh, we refer to it all as the choice of drug, as if mm. it's such a simple thing. In reality, it's it's probably the biggest decision that consumes the entire family and surrounding and oncologists and several opinions is, is this because we don't really, uh, I mean, some, some cases, you know, exactly what to prescribe. This is stage 2B for that. The first line is this and that's it. Mm -hmm. The reality is if you have exactly profile of two patients with the same stage 2B, uh, same age, same profile, same disease diagnostic, same everything, and you prescribe the same first line. Many times one would respond, the second would not. So right. it's it's really, um, we don't have, we don't know enough. Right. Um, so it's a, it's a huge decision. The dosage, uh, is it responding and you live in sort of every three months or six months intervals or weeks mm -hmm. sometimes, depending on the disease. It's a huge, huge decision, and it, and then the family gets involved, or the patient wants a second opinion, and another doctor would have, well, have you thought about this? Then it drives you into a different direction, and, and it's just a continuous journey of frustration and frustration, sure. which could be um, could be shortcutted by doing some of these tests. Mm -hmm. We could tell you that you know, well, if you start with hundred drugs here are the four that work and here's the 50 that will not work for sure so it's it, it, a huge driver uh in in the treatment decision 
um, it, it really helps. Um, I remember times where with some of my family members were debating whether we add to this drug, this other drug, and this adjuvant, and this, mm -hmm. and we all become scientists at the end of the day. And, you know, <laughs> it's very frustrating. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also had uh, patients that come to us with, uh, they tell us, look, I, I, I've had this disease. I went to my doctor. He said, well, the first line is these four options. Uh, you have about 20, 30% response, or sometimes more. What do you want to start with? And I mean, as a patient, that's a very frustrating and, and scary position to be in because you have to make a decision based on something completely, you have no idea what you're doing. So uh, there are the opposite sides of there are choices and we don't really have a way to eliminate or prioritize these choices, but yet you have to start somewhere. Yes. And, and we work from, you know, trial and error. We, we try something, if it doesn't work, we try something else. But you know what, if you're getting the toxicity and not the benefit from these very powerful medications. That's not a good quality of life, and it's not uh, begs Completely. begs the point of you know even going through that direction. Right. There was another uh, study that shows that about a third of patients are on the wrong treatment. Um, really, officially are on the wrong treatment, um, and, and that by itself shows you that the the choice of the right treatment is a very difficult one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, we agree, and we hear that constantly through our our community, and um, okay. it, it's it's something that's discussed an awful lot. We try to, um, to to help educate the community as much as possible by providing resources, which is why this this uh, dovetails very nicely into our mission. Um, and, but we also urge them to be their own best advocate, and by putting. Um, putting a couple of extra bullets in their six shooter, which, which would be the um, stormite tumor uh, process, then we aid and abet the decision-making process so that they can optimize that. And, and you said something <clears throat> to the extent of maximizing the value of, uh, of chemo treatments, and this is a perfect tool for doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this has been great. We have like notes and everything. We've been like <laughs> taking notes of all of this, so I appreciate it. Um, Fair so, how can our listeners get in touch with Storm My Teamer? What's you? Uh, there's, there's our. We have a website, and and there's a lot of information there to start with. Uh, but by all means, we have. Uh, they can call us. Uh, we have patient advisors that can talk to them. Um, we. we a stormite tumor is a misleading name to what we really do. It's the first step in a journey, in a process. In a perfect world, our name would be maybe Advanced Cancer Solutions or something. <laughs> um, because the tumor is the entry point into this journey of profiling and studying and researching mm -hmm. and testing and then immunotherapy as well. Sure. Um, so um, we have discussions, we understand the patient's needs. Uh, the treatment strategy from the oncologist perspective and we try to explain how um, uh, the cancer cells could help the patient at some point in time you know put it into perspective of their their environment so i think that usually helps a lot uh, as opposed to theoretically you know um, uh, talking about it but by all means call us uh, we will uh, we will try to help you as much as we can Okay. Um, explaining scientific concepts in plain English is a very big thing uh, that we constantly hear and, and uh, we've learned to speak in very simple language. So we hope um, that that helps and, and, uh, and we're here to help. All right, well, have a okay. great evening and we'll chat Wonderful. soon. Maybe you can take off your shirt now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to casual. Time, time for some breakfast. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye, Michelle. Bye-bye. <laughs>
We love hearing from you. Please remember that the content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only and because each person is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Views and opinions expressed in our podcast and website are our own and do not represent that of our workplaces. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions, or corrections. In no way does listening, reading, emailing, or interacting on social media with our content establish a doctor-patient relationship. Thanks. Until next time, talk to you then.